Many of you are familiar with this story, but there's always somebody for whom it is new. <clears throat> the old story of uh, Holmes and Watson on a camping trip, you remember? And they were sound asleep, and after some excessive amount of liquid refreshment, woke up in the middle of the night, and Holmes looks at Watson, nudges him, and says, Watson, look up, what do you see? And Watson says, I see stars and stars and more stars. Holmes says, what does that tell you, Watson? He said, well, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of uh, galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, it tells me that Saturn is in Leo. Orologically, it tells me that it's about quarter to three in the morning. Meteorologically, it tells me that tomorrow will probably be a beautiful day. Theologically, it tells me that this is a vast universe and we are just a tiny part of the great whole. Why, Holmes, what does it tell you? He says, Watson, you idiot, somebody has stolen our tent. <laughs> you know, you can be very profound in an answer and miss the larger point. And I think what happens with this whole flirtation that I call messing so much with the ideas of atheism and uh, not thinking of the ramifications, we really fail to understand where life ultimately goes if you choose to live out, live it, and define it without God. Years ago, somebody penned these words that I'd like to read for you. It goes like this. First, dentistry was painless, then bicycles were chainless, and carriages were horseless, and many laws enforceless. Next, cookery was fireless, telegraphy was wireless, cigars were nicotineless, and coffee caffeineless. Soon oranges were seedless, the putting green was weedless, the college boy was hatless, the proper diet fatless. New motor roads are dustless, the latest steel is rustless, our tennis courts are sodless, our new religion godless. That struggle of trying to explain life having lost all points of reference is really the struggle one has to deal with if we choose to live our existence without any transcendent ontic point of reference. Either we go inwards or we go laterally. We find no point of testing what really defines the most critical questions of life. And to the credit of Friedrich Nietzsche, when he wrestled with the idea of the madman running into the marketplace and looking for God in his Thus Spake Zarathustra, one has to at least credit Nietzsche with the fact that he was dealing with the entailments of that kind of conclusion. His metaphors are poignant, and you'll begin to see what it is he's really asking once he himself philosophically is coming to that conclusion. Here's what he says about the madman. Have you not heard of that madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours, ran to the marketplace and cried incessantly, I'm looking for God, I'm looking for God. As many of those who did not believe in God were standing together there, he excited considerable laughter. Have you lost him then, said one. Did he lose his way like a child, said another. Or maybe he's hiding. Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage or emigrated? So they shouted and shouted and laughed him to scorn. But the madman sprang into their midst and pierced them with his glances. Where is God, he cried. I'll tell you, we have killed him. You and I, we're all his murderers. But how have we done this? How were we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us a sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What did we do when we unchained this earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Whither are we moving now? Away from all suns? Are we not perpetually falling backwards, forwards, sidewards in all directions? Is there any up or down left? Are we not straying through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Has it not suddenly become colder? Is not more and more night coming on us all the time? Must not lanterns now have to be lit in the morning hours? Do we not hear anything yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? God? Do we not smell anything yet of God's decomposition? God is, God is dead and he decomposes too, you know. God remains dead and we've killed him. 
how shall we, the murderer of all murderers, now compose ourselves? Because that which was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has ever possessed has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood from us? With what water can we purify ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games will we need to invent? Is not this the greatest of deeds too great for us? Must we not ourselves now have to become God simply to seem worthy of what we have done. There's never been a greater deed, you know, and whoever shall be born after us for the sake of this deed shall be part of a higher history than all history hitherto. Here the madman fell silent and again regarded his listeners. They too were silent and they stared at him in astonishment. At last he threw his lantern to the ground and broke and went out. I come too early, maybe. My time has not yet come. This tremendous event is still on its way, still traveling, and has not yet reached the ears of men. Lightning and thunder require time. The light of the stars requires time. Deeds require time, even after they are done before they can be seen and heard. This deed is still more distant from them than the distant stars, and yet they have done it themselves. It has been related further on the same day that the madman entered diverse churches and there sang a requiem, Eternum Deo. Let out and quieted, he is said to have retorted each time, what are these sepulchres now if they are not the tombs and sepulchres of a dead God? I recall some years ago, and it's still during the Cold War in the 1980s, having to speak at the Center for Geopolitical Strategy in Moscow and followed immediately after that at the Lenin Military Academy. It was as ice cold a situation, emotionally speaking, as you could imagine. I was literally put at a, at a table and a, in the front of a table and a chair all by myself in the entire faculty circle, the room there in their uniforms and were gonna quiz me for about three hours on this whole issue of theism vis-a-vis -vis atheism. It was a nerve-wracking situation to be in, with their ice-cold stares and their pointed questions coming obviously in a very hostile way, giving all kinds of illustrations from their history. And I remember making the defense of theism there, and I'll never forget the statement made by the head of the institution, all of their great leaders. If you walked in, it's, uh, it's eight stories above ground and four stories below ground. Uh, from Peter the Great to all the way to Kutuzov the general and to their modern leaders, their pictures were on the wall. And uh, my wife was with me and one of my colleagues. And as we were walking out, the head of the institution grabbed my hand and he looked at me and I quote and tell you exactly what he said. He says, Mr. Zacharias, I'm afraid I think you are right, but it's very difficult to change after 70 years of believing a lie. I didn't put those words into his mouth. But he knew, he knew the ramifications of what happened when Stalin moved from a study in a seminary preparing for the ministry to an avowed disbelief in God. And after having eliminated 15 million of his own people, Svetlana testified, sustained by two or three historians since, and Svetlana before the BBC in an interview said this, Muggery, Malcolm Muggeridge, the journalist who had interviewed her, personally told me this story while I was visiting him. He said, hunched over as an old man, he said, I'll never forget what Svetlana described in the death of her father. As she stood by his bedside, the last thing that Joseph Stalin did, the last physical act was to clench his fist towards the heavens one more time, threw his head back on the pillow and he was gone. He'd lived a life with the ramifications of having wiped away the horizon, needing a lantern to be lit in the morning hours, sacred games that he tried to invent. Who gave us such power to do this? Who will wipe the blood from the knives that we have used, philosophically speaking? Atheism is flirting with the same dangers. To his credit, and I quote David Berlinsky, a skeptic himself, who quoted Richard Dawkins in an interview and gave him credit for an answer. When Dawkins was asked if he would really want to live with the metaphysical moral ramifications of the Darwinian worldview. Dawkins was asked this question and Berlinsky quotes him. Dawkins says, no. And he was asked why. He said the end result could be fascism. This was Dawkins.
Now, Dawkins doesn't necessarily, of course, believe that there's no point of reference for good and bad and whatever, but when pushed on the whole issue of a Darwinian metaphysic extrapolated into the value system, he said, no, the logical outworking could be fascism itself. But here's what I want to do. I want to start off by defining what atheism is because sometimes there's a softer version that is treated as atheism, but which is really not. It is, it is an agnosticism. Somebody saying, I don't know, I don't claim to know. If I have enough evidence, I would believe, but I'm not going to come hard line down and say in a categoric denial of the absolute, uh, the existence of a personal moral first cause. Etienne Bourne, the French philosopher, says this, atheism is the deliberate, definite, dogmatic denial of the existence of God. It is not satisfied with appropriate truth or relative truth, but claims to see the ins and outs of the game quite clearly, being the absolute denial of the absolute. Paul Edwards, volume one, page 175 in his multiple volume Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Here's what he says. An atheist is a person who maintains, who maintains that there is no God. That is that the sentence God exists expresses a false proposition. He's a person who rejects belief in God. So there you have both from Etienne Bourne and from Paul Edwards how the definitions actually fall out in a philosophical dictionary on what atheism averse and what it ultimately clings to. Now, if I, you know, I came, uh, sometimes when I describe myself as having come from an atheistic background, it's probably a strong term. I was more non-theistic, never gave the idea of a personal God any, a, any credence in my life. Growing up in the city of, I was born in the south, in the city of Chennai, and uh, raised in the north. My parents, one came from Kerala, one came from Chennai. My dad was from Kerala, mother was from Chennai. Kerala has produced some of the greatest uh, Hindu philosophers in India, and uh, some of the biggest names in, uh, in Hindu philosophy come from Kerala. It's sort of the intellectual philosophical capital uh, of the land of India itself. My dad descended directly from the Nambudris, which were the highest caste of the Hindu priesthood. So all that going back for century, for, for decades into my heritage, but uh, somewhere along the line, a conversion had taken place, but it became very nominal. The Christianity in my home was completely nominal. I had no personal interest. I don't think in my, all of the way up to my late teens had ever cracked, cracked open a Bible on my own. Frankly, I don't know if we had one in our house. But that's the way I lived and thought. And actually, when I finally encountered these struggles and these claims, it had a dramatic impact upon my life. I'll probably save that for later. The struggle I've had since then in my teens as I struggled and thought of the ramifications of a naturalistic, materialistic world, word, uh, world of ours with no transcendent, no personal moral first cause, where does one go with definitions? How do we define the most essential things in life? Do you realize right now, even in this most sophisticated part of the world in higher education, go to the United Kingdom or come here and you ask an average student two or three questions and those questions are almost unanswerable. What does it mean to be human? Ask an average student today, what does it really mean to be human? I was asked to contribute to that subject at Johns Hopkins University some years ago, and most of the contributors were from a completely non-theistic viewpoint. Francis Collins and I represented the theistic viewpoint there. Questions of sexuality. What does it all really mean? These questions have become almost undefinable. And we go through this quicksand and walk through it, trying to find our way by changing all the definitions, but we don't know how to define it except by self-referencing. So four ramifications follow when you deny a personal God moral first cause. The first one is very difficult to anchor an absolute moral law. Very difficult to pin that anywhere. How does one actually arrive at moral reasoning 
trying to find the explanation for good and bad. Now, to be sure, naturalists have made every effort. Uh, in fact, Sam Harris's latest book, as a student of neuroscience at Stanford, he's made a valiant effort to explain all of this as he sees it. Nothing new in the argumentation, nothing new has come. Because if you take his presuppositions, it still holds true that there are at least seven forms of humanism that can develop in their ethical theories. There's the evolutionary humanism of Huxley, the behavioral humanism of of Skinner, the existential humanism of Jean-Paul Sartre, the pragmatic humanism of Dewey, the Marxist humanism of Marx and Feuerbach, the egocentric humanism of Ayn Rand, and the cultural humanism of Carlos Lamont. Just take two of them, the, the, the materialistic humanism of Marx or Lenin and so on, and of uh, the egocentric humanism of Ayn Rand, two completely different political theories emerging from both of their pens, both from a starting point of no God. So it, it does, doesn't hold true when they tell you, we can find a logical outworking to this. We can reasonably arrive at this. You know, we are all ultimately framed and shaped in ways that truly force us to rethink our whole worldview at some point in life where something very difficult transpires. I was uh, invited, when I was still in, um, in my 30s and 40s, I was invited to lecture in the Krakow, Poland, and in Warsaw. The Cold War was still raging. And I arrived in Warsaw, finished my talks, and the man who had invited me asked me if I'd ever been to a death camp. And I told him, yes, I'd been to Buchenwald and Dachau, and so on. He said, no, no, they're concentration camps. Have you ever been to a death camp? I said, not, I think, the way you're now been pointing it. He said, tomorrow we've got a free day, I'm going to drive you. I'm going to drive you to Auschwitz. I said, really? He said, yeah, it's a bit of a drive, but we'll go. And Hendrik Wehe, my Polish host, put me into his car on a cold, foggy day, and we drove and drove and drove. I did not realize what awaited me that day. As a young, you know, in my 20s, I'd been to Vietnam. I was invited by the chaplains with the Milieu's military to come there and covered the length, and length of the country from Vum Tau in the south all the way to Quang Tri. I'd seen warfare firsthand as a younger man, and it really rattled me to my boots a bit. But nothing like what I was going to see in Auschwitz. If you have never ever been there, you ought to make at some point a journey in your life to visit it and just sit there for an hour or so thinking about what it is you're witnessing. As we arrived there and walked from room to room, I saw some Polish teenagers, I, th I assumed they were Polish, but at one point they had to flee from one of the rooms and burst out sobbing. When I left the building, I still saw them sitting on the front steps with their face in their hands, and in one room where they left, behind glass was 12,000 pounds of women's hair as the women had been scalped before being put, in, put into the gas ovens, and those, that hair was then taken and woven and sold as, as sacks in the marketplace. Little boys experimented upon by Joseph Mengele, twins. The pictures of those little boys will be ingrained in your memory when you see it. Mengele only, not too, uh, more recently passed away after never have, never have been caught hiding somewhere in Argentina. Standing like this, totally emaciated, staring glassy-eyed into the camera as they were photographed, castrated by Mengele for his experiments. And then I walked finally to the room where they were told they were getting their showers, but where they were gat gassed to death in this camp alone at the rate of 12,000 every day. And outside the room were the words of Adolf Hitler. I want to raise a generation of young people devoid of a conscience, imperious, relentless, and cruel. I thought to myself, what happened in the mind of a man who swayed one of the most brilliant nations into either coming along with him or paid dearly with their own lives if they did not condescend in some way? while so many knew what was happening and daren't speak lest they be part of the whole gas oven episode. In today's newspaper in the Daily Mail in London, there's a critique given of a new book by a professor from King's College who's written a book called The Dictators. And he has covered in one chapter Hitler and another chapter Stalin. And he has clearly delineated, so forget all this 
stuff that you'll sometimes hear from atheistic philosophers. Christopher Hitchens was one of them. And with this writer refers to Hitchens and Dawkins and some of the others as sort of doing cartwheels on the pin on the head of a pin, trying to prove their point that Hitler was a, a Christian, that Hitler was a God-fearing man. Read the specific statements in this latest book called The Dictator of what Hitler's goal was all about, what his view was on the Christian faith. In fact, Hannah Arendt, who describes the last walk of Adolf Eichmann as he was going to his execution, Hannah Arendt, if I'm not mistaken, was uh, uh, I think wedded to, or certainly the mistress of Martin Heidegger, the, the German philosopher who did not know how to exactly come down on the Holocaust himself. But here's Anna, Hannah Arendt uh, writing in her, uh, in her book on Adolf Eichmann. Listen to this last paragraph. Adolf Eichmann went to the gallows with great dignity. He had asked for a bottle of red wine and drunk half of it. He refused the help of the Protestant minister, the Reverend William Hull, who offered to read the Bible with him. He had only two more hours to live and therefore, quote, no time to waste for me, he said. He walked the 50 yards from his cell to the execution chamber, calm and erect, with his hands bound behind him. When the guards tied his ankles and knees, he asked them to loosen the bonds so that he could stand more straight. I don't need that, he said. When the black hood was offered him, he was in complete command of himself. Nay, he was more. He was really completely himself. Nothing could have demonstrated this more convincingly than the grotesque silliness of his last words. He began emphatically by stating that he was no believer in God to, ex to express the common phrase that he was no Christian and did not believe in life after death. But then he proceeded. After a short while, gentlemen, we shall all meet again. Such is the fate of all men. Long live Germany. Long live Argentina. Long live Austria. I shall not forget them. In the face of death, he had found the cliché used in funeral oratory. Under the gallows, his memory played him the last trick. He was elated, and he forgot that really this was his own funeral. It was as though in those last minutes, he was summing up the lesson that this long course in human wickedness has taught us, the lesson of the fearsome word and thought-defying banality of evil. The trivialization of evil. That's exactly what happens when you do away with a moral point of reference and a sacred definition of human essence. You desacralize life, and all of this becomes nothing more than political game playing. And that's why Richard Rorty, who had no critique to offer the Holocaust, except that I, I find it revolting, says this. If moral imperatives are not commanded by God's will, and if they are not in some sense absolute, then what ought to be is a matter simply of what any one of us decides should be. There is no other source of individual, there is no other source of judgment. Kai Nielsen, the Canadian atheist, the thing that troubles me is this. We have not been able to show that reason, notice what he's saying, that reason requires the moral point of view. He's not talking about pragmatism. He's talking about rationality now. It requires the moral point of view. Or that really rational persons unhoodwinked by myth or ideology need not be individual egoists or classical amoralists. Reason really doesn't decide here. The picture I've painted for you is not a pleasant one. Reflection on this depresses me. Pure practical reason, even with a good knowledge of the facts, will not take you to morality. And then a footnote by Bertrand Russell. He says, you know, I cannot live as though ethical values are simply a matter of my personal taste, and therefore I have found my own views actually quite incredible. I don't know what the answer is. Pretty grim stuff. And so if you ask me what happens when uh, we abandon God and move away to self-referencing moral reasoning, I like reading the poets. I like listening to the lyrics of songwriters, because they are sometimes much more poignant and admitting reality than abstract philosophers might do. Here's one of the rock groups, uh, King, King Crimson, years ago. Cat's Foot, Iron Claw, Neurosurgeons, Scream for More, from Paranoia's Poison Door, 21st Century, Schizoid Man. Blood Rack, Barbed Wire, Politician's Funeral Pyre, Innocents Raped with Napalm Fire, 21st Century, Schizoid Man.
Death seed, blind man's greed, poet starving, children bleed, nothing he's got he really needs, 21st century schizoid man. The walls on which the prophets wrote is cracking at the seams. Upon the instruments of death, the sunlight brightly gleams. Will no one lay the laurel wreath as silence drowns the screams? Between the iron gates of fate, the seeds of time are sown and watered by the deeds of those who know and who are known. Knowledge is a deadly friend. When no one sets the rules, the fate of all mankind I see is in the hands of fools. Confusion will be my epitaph as I crawl a cracked and broken path. If we make it, we can all sit back and laugh but I'm afraid tomorrow I'll be crying. Songwriters, my study of the romantic poets, lyricists, poets, you saw what they were saying in reality because they connected this with this, the head with the heart and the entailments that follow. Why am I not an atheist? I simply cannot find a rationally defensible way for moral reasoning. And the fact of the matter is we are at our core moral beings. Those who deny God's existence, what do they invoke? Too much of evil and suffering. On what basis? How do they even arrive at that moral reasoning? Number two, the question of meaning. How do we arrive at the reality of meaning? What meaning do we really attribute to life? Are we entitled to our own definition? of meaning. Or like the myth of Sisyphus, do we roll the stone up the hill and watch that row of stone rolling down again, monotony and do this uh, uh, each day? You know, I live in a, uh, in a condominium in Atlanta <clears throat> and uh, just opposite our apartment there is, uh, uh, is a play, little playground for dogs and uh, every morning 6 or 6.30 they're all out with their dogs and uh, somebody comes, throws the ball, the dog runs, picks it up, brings it back. And one morning I was sitting there in a rather cynical state of mind and I was thinking to myself, they bring the dogs out, throw the ball, the ball goes, the dog brings it back. About 20 times the dog's had his fill for the morning, they take it back and feed it. I said in a little way, in a, little way, in a purely naturalistic sense, that's what we are too. We get into our car with the dog chasing the ball, go and do our thing from nine to five and come back home. It's that repetitive monotony again and again and again. And we often assume that meaninglessness in our lives ultimately comes from becoming weary of pain. Suffering, evil, struggle, angst, or what the Muslim might call the jihad, the, the struggle for existence and so on, that this is what we face. You know what the worst kind of meaninglessness is? Not the ones who have become weary of pain, but the ones who have become weary of pleasure. That is the ultimate kind of meaninglessness that is most painful. I did a series of books on imaginary conversations. The first one I did was uh, uh, The Lotus and the Cross, Jesus Talks to Buddha. The second one I did was uh, Sense and Sensuality, Jesus Talks to Oscar Wilde, and did about half a dozen in that series. But I remember going to Paris, going to England, to do some research on Oscar Wilde. Went and visiting the hotel where he ultimately passed away in his 40s. And Oscar Wilde, this father of dandyism, as it were, enjoying that unfettered life, I find fascinating two things that he really, in fact, actually with three when you think about it. When he wrote the picture of Dorian Gray, you almost wonder there was something autobiographical in the emptiness that he himself found towards the middle years of his life. But he is lying in bed in the hotel in Paris, and he asks an incredible question of his lover, Robbie Ross. He looks at Robbie Ross and he says to him, did you ever love any one of those young boys for their own sake? How does a hedonist come out with a question like that on love being defined as of merit for its own sake? Robbie Ross looked at him and he said, no, I never loved any one of them for their own sake. I love them for my sake. He said, Robbie, neither did I. Get me a priest. And when you read his book, The Ballad of Reading Jail, it's a brilliant piece of poetry with multiple stanzas. And in the heart of that poetry, it talks about the woman with the alabaster ointment who had made her living probably by prostituting herself, who comes and falls at the feet of Jesus. And he makes reference to that 
and said, maybe only Christ is big enough now to forgive and to heal this soul of mine. And if you go to see his grave at that big cemetery in Paris, there's a giant phoenix in that, on that, in that cemetery with Oscar Wilde's name. And the verse he selected for his epitaph was from the book of Job. A pleasure-driven man going to the book on suffering to describe his own life. Loneliness is a terrible thing when you have exhausted pleasure and find you have come away empty-handed. And to you, young students, I tell you, the world is yours out there with all kinds of pleasure. And the most pitiful state to reach is when you have exhausted it and find out that it really didn't take you anywhere, it didn't bring you what you thought it would. So meaning, what really brings meaning? What brings purpose in life? How do we find this in, this, in, this, in the sense of finding not just existential fulfillment, but a definitive purpose by which to measure where you are on this journey of life's meaning. I've traveled now for four decades, and I was raised with almost no money in my pocket ever. In fact, something very sad happened today, and. Uh, some of you may know my story, and I came to know Christ when I was on a bed of suicide at the age of 17 in the city of Delhi. Tried to take my own life, totally empty. When a man walked into my hospital room and brought me a Bible and led me and gave that Bible, he couldn't stay because he wasn't allowed. I was in a pretty depleted state. My body dehydrated. He gave it to my mother who struggled through the English and that and read it for me, whatever. But I made my commitment to Christ at the age of 17 on a bed of suicide. This morning I got the word that my friend who had come into that hospital room, is, he was in his uh, late 70s, passed away last night. So I spoke to his daughter. Where she, she calls me Uncle Ravi now. and it, She said, Uncle Ravi, the last three weeks, he spent every day watching you on YouTube. I said, that's terrible. He could have got a better picture than that. She said, no. <laughs> but you know, last week when I spoke to him on the phone, he said, Ravi, sometimes I think my whole purpose in this world was to bring you to Christ. And he says, I draw such great joy from that. And he, the reason I mentioned that, I told Tammy, his daughter, I said, Tam, when I phoned your dad last week to find out how he was doing, he asked me how I was doing financially. He said, can I send you something? I said, no, Fred, I'm, I'm fine. I said, I'm calling to just chat, find out how you are. And I said, you know, Tammy, when I was a young teenager, he'd drive us to the place where we were doing our Bible study and sit in the front of the car and toss his wallet back into my hand. He said, let's go and get some Cokes and samosas and have some fun this evening. And we'd go and get ourselves some Cokes, six or seven of us in the car. I said, and your dad hardly had any income at that stage. That was the generosity with which he lived. So I was raised with very little. Not making a sob story, I'm just telling you that. Now it's my privilege to see people with a lot. I had dinner one night with the seventh wealthiest man in the world. I asked him, whatever brought you to inviting me to come and speak to your staff? He said, a, long a little while ago, I phoned my wife from the 70th floor or something of my building, and I told her, I'm a very lonely man. She said, so am I. He said, what do we do? She said, I don't know, but there's a church opposite one of the apartment buildings we own. Maybe we should go there, then we won't have to pay for parking. <laughs> and you know what he told me? When he could buy everything he wanted, he had never reached such a lonely moment as that. It's true. So think about it. What really brings life meaning? No moral point of reference, no meaning. Thirdly, quickly, there is no hope. Death becomes the end. And for all of those who want moral reasoning, I ask you, if death is the end, when that moment comes, there's ultimately no difference between a Mother Teresa and an Adolf Hitler. If there's no justice, if there's no judgment, ultimately there is really no comma, a punctuation mark, it's a full stop. How does one really 
a, a hold to a worldview where such are the ramifications of huge differences in lifestyles and values and ethics. I stood behind Mother Teresa on two or three occasions. In fact, I was, I was asked by one of the leading televisions to come and uh, anchor her funeral. I, I couldn't do that. But I remember this diminutive woman with all of her limited physical capacity living with this little white sari around her. She, when she died, there were only three saris in her trunk. That's all she had. And yet, the homes she built, one is called Nirmal Hriday, which is a ten meets tender heart, watching how she rescued the masses in Atlanta, Calcutta, and many other parts of the globe. A woman who gave herself to such incredible sacrifice. And what does Hitchens do with a life like that? Writes a vulgarly titled book called The Missionary Position. That's all he had to say about a woman like that where Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Buddhists, all of them were at her funeral to recognize her as one of the great luminaries of our time who lived with such sacrifice and such selflessness. Do we not see the difference? Do we not see the difference on what basis? No moral law, no meaning, no hope. You know, it's amazing what death does to a human life when you've lost somebody near and dear. I was in my 20s when I lost my mom. She was in her 50s. You look at life from a different paradigm at that moment. The great philosopher, theologian, Nicholas Wolterstorff, taught at Yale, he's in his 80s. Wolterstorff made this comment after he lost his son in a mountain climbing accident. He says, you know, when we have finished conquering absence, with a cell phone, conquering heat with our air conditioners, conquering our winglessness with airplanes, conquering, conquering distances with transportation, we'll still end up having to deal with the evil in our heart and death. The whole hope of the resurrection, we've just celebrated Easter, regardless of what you think about it, there's a logical flow to it. And I ask you this question. It was Thomas Aquinas who said, the thing that intrigued him most about the disciples who are willing to pay with their lives is that they weren't in a herd mentality, all of them sitting in one room saying, Le, bravo, let's, let's die for this. They all died alone in different settings. Thomas Aquinas came to my country and preached the gospel there and paid with his own life. And that's why the oldest church in India is named after him, the Martoma Church. Peter, Paul, they didn't do this for some kind of a uh, hallucination experience in their background. They came to the realization that the risen Christ had redefined all of history for them. And that's why he carried his message everywhere. Hope, hope beyond the grave, hope for now. Without God, I find no point of reference for morality except self-referencing. No ultimate point of reference for meaning except whatever you choose to give to yourself. No ultimate hope beyond the grave. And finally, if one is wrong in all of these choices, if one is wrong in all of these choices, then you say to yourself, what is the recovery line? Where do I turn now for recourse when everything else I lived for was contrary to what I now think I must face? That's why Jean-Paul Sartre found himself literally on his deathbed saying, I found my philosophy unlivable. And his mistress standing by his bedside said he's losing his mind. Maybe for the first time then he really found it. Some of you may know the name, the great name of Francis Schaeffer. He was a great philosopher in the Christian world in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I had the privilege of just meeting him once. His son, who went as Frankie Schaeffer, now as Frank Schaeffer, turned his back upon all this belief, turned his back upon it and wrote some pretty bitter books against Christian, the Christian faith, the evangelical faith, and all of that about his father. The pretty nasty stuff that he got into by his own recognition. His mother, at the age of 98, passed away this week. In the Huffington Post, he's written a tribute to his mother. If you haven't read it, read it. He talks about his mom, who loved him unconditionally, even in the days where he was writing profane stuff.
got into a relationship, had an illegitimate child. He said, my mother was always there, loving me unconditionally. She introduced me to the great musicians, to the great artists, to the great writers, and he goes through the list many times there. And he said, I spoke to her last week, and he goes through his relationship, how she loved him. He said, now I'm a grandfather, married with my children and their children. And he ends his tribute to his mother with these incredible words. He says, Mom, you won, I believe. Mom, you won, I believe. There's just enough of a human in me to say, you know, Frankie, she would have loved it if you told her that minutes before she's gone. She would have just had a smile on her face. But she had enough of confidence that her son would ultimately come through. I don't know where you're at in your life, but I want to say to you, the abandoning of God leaves you with some extraordinarily tough questions. Moral law, hope, meaning, and if all goes wrong as you're coming to the end and you say, I've got to change my mind, what then? I think in my graduate, postgraduate work studying uh, some of the great philosophers, especially Anthony Flew in his atheism, having to respond to Flew during my days at Cambridge there. And then, of course, all of a sudden, a few years later, a few years ago, Flew says he's no longer an atheist. I thought I wasted all my time and all these years, and the boys, uh, <laughs> uh, but he described himself as best a deist. But he did go on to say, if there is, some, if there is a truth, it'll have to be in the person of Jesus Christ. And so I say to you, when you're thinking of all that it costs, think of that's what Pascal meant existentially, not as a last minute wager. He said, the existentialist challenges me and asks me, what if I'm wrong? He said, well, existentially, I'm fulfilled. I have nothing to lose. I'm a happy man. And at the end of my life, if it's wrong, then I have no point, no way to regret what I found my happiness in. But how inestimable is the loss of one who rejects God and finds out he or she was wrong. That was what the Pascalian wager was all about. And so I leave you with the challenge to ask you to think about the truth of what I have just said to you. And I leave you with two quotes, and then I end. Viktor Frankl, somebody was talking to me about Ernest Gordon, who was your chaplain some years ago. I remember reading his book, They're just a, a brilliant, brilliant writer. And Ernest Gordon, too, had been in a concentration camp, as was Viktor Frankl. Frankl says this, if we present man with a concept of man, which is not true, we may well corrupt him. When we present him as, as an automaton of reflexes, as a mind machine, as a bundle of instincts, as a pawn of drives and reactions, as a mere product of instincts, heredity, and environment, we will then feed the nihilism to which modern man is in any case prone. I became acquainted with the last stage of corruption in my second concentration camp, Auschwitz. The gas chambers of Auschwitz were the ultimate consequence of the theory that man is nothing but the product of heredity and environment, or as the Nazis like to say, of blood and soil. I am absolutely convinced that the gas chambers of Auschwitz, Treblinka, and Majdanek were ultimately prepared, not in some ministry of defense or other, other in Berlin, but rather at the desks and in the lecture halls of nihilistic scientists and philosophers. So an academy like this has an immense responsibility on what it does behind its lecter behind lectures, lecterns and its lecture halls and what it imparts to you. Matthew Paris is a prominent journalist in the United Kingdom, an atheist and with a lifestyle that would be very contrary to the theistic framework. He was raised in Malawi, and he went to Malawi two Christmases ago, and he came back and he wrote a stunning article in uh, The Times. He said, I find myself shocked that I'm about to say what I'm going to say. He said, because it challenges every philosophical bone in my body. He said, as one who has lived disavowing God and as an atheist, I'm staggered by the fact of what I'm seeing and about to state in this article. He said, Africa is in serious trouble. And he goes on to describe all that is going on there. He says, and if something doesn't happen, it'll end up with the sinister mix of Nike and the machete at the same time. 
And he says, what I've concluded is this, Africa doesn't just need another ethical theory. He said, what I saw with my own eyes was what the Christian gospel did for the people, how that new birth changed their hearts. He said, I'm amazed that I'm saying things like this. He said, and yet I'm convinced an ethical theory is not what the African continent needs. It needs the gospel of regeneration and the gospel of redemption. I would have just added one footnote to Mr. Paris's words. Mr. Paris, not just Africa, the whole world. That's what the whole world needs. Why am I not an atheist? I simply cannot build a life coherently with life's deepest questions that continue to haunt when you're running from God. I leave that with you for thought and will respond to your questions along with Vince Vitale. Thank you very much.